ahead and get started. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of Zoom meetings competing for your attention, so we are very happy that you are here to uh, talk with us today. Um, we are going to talk about birth control access in the states and how we think some of these lessons can apply to uh, Congress and some of the things that we think the steps that can be taken, um, both on the state and federal levels. Um, we will also be joined, um, hopefully shortly, by Representative Joel Kitchens from Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin is actually holding an emergency session on COVID right now, um, so he's taking part in that, and then hopefully we will get a little bit of his time toward the end. Um, and otherwise, we will get started. So um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with me or R Street and our work on this, my name is Courtney Joslin. Uh, I am a Commercial Freedom Fellow with the R Street Institute. Um, we work on a whole host of different things as a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. Um, but in particular, my team focuses on commercial freedom and allowing people to access the things that they want in a safe and sensible manner. Um, and part of this requires that we look at birth control, deregulation, and where it makes sense. Um, and we uh, are, are big advocates for allowing uh, better access to birth control in a number of ways. Um, so a big push that I'm sure most of you are, are the most familiar with is either the over-the-counter push for birth control, which is a federal effort. Um, and then of course, uh, birth control access is sort of typically um, thought of as a center left proposal focusing on cost um, and on insurance coverage of birth control. But what we have uh, really focused on is that, you know, access to birth control goes beyond just the, the cost of the pill. Um, it goes into whether or not you can access a doctor in the first place, how, you know, your appointment schedules are, are you know, how, how well your doctor is able to get you in for regular appointments, um, whether you're able to maintain your prescription uh, refills at a, in a reasonable amount of time. And of course, all of these things are uh, only uh, emphasized by the current pandemic happening. So um, if anything, I think that some of the stuff we're going to hear today is even more important than it's ever been, especially as people are even less able to get to a doctor. So we're going to talk to our panelists here, which I will briefly introduce to you. Um, and we will hear from some of them on some of the questions that I want to ask them. Um, and then after we have about 40 minutes of discussion, we will open the panel up for questions from all of you. And the way we're going to ask you to submit questions is through the Q&A button. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A with two little chat boxes. And if you hit that, you can submit a question and we will answer them in order um, toward the end. And feel free any time to submit a question. And then we will um, we will open it up to that at, toward the end. So um, thank you all for for using the Q and A. I think that will make it the easiest. Um, so with us today, we have three panelists that I'm very much looking forward to hearing more from. Um, first, we have Tara Mancini from Power to Decide. And um, if you're unfamiliar with Power to Decide, they focus on uh, many many reproductive health issues, um, and in particular, they one of the, the, the things that I have been uh, most thankful to them for are their uh, state and federal legislative tracking. Um, and they really focus on what the states are doing. And Tara is, uh, she is a big part of that state outreach and uh, legislative tracking. So we'll hear a lot from what they have seen uh, from Power to Decide. We also have Sally Raffi of Birth Control Pharmacist. You can find them at birthcontrolpharmacist.com. Um, Sally is doing some really interesting work out of uh, the University of California, San Diego, um, where she focuses specifically on um, getting pharmacists trained to, pre to prescribe birth control um, to patients. And she's done this in a number of states, even though she's based in California, she's worked a lot with states on getting uh, training programs approved for pharmacists and working with pharmacists themselves on all their questions, what they have, the questions that they have. Um, and then we also have Rebecca Stone, who is also a pharmacist, and she's out of the University of Georgia. Um, I would say go dogs, but I'm a Tennessee fan. But um, so she's at the University of Georgia where she teaches, uh, she's a clinical associate professor there. Um, and as well as worked in, in the pharmacy uh, arena and is focused a lot on reproductive rights as well. So um, we have a lot of interesting people here today. 
And as I said, we may be joined in a little bit by Representative Kitchens from Wisconsin, um, but we'll hold for a little bit for him and uh, hopefully we'll hear from him as well. So, and you may also hear my dog. Uh, it's about the mail time, so I apologize, but I'll go ahead and get us started with a question. Uh, I'll start off with you, Tara. Uh, I know Power to Decide has focused on both federal and state efforts, but and we focus a lot on our state efforts on pharmacy access, uh, but could you tell us some of the uh, unique things you're seeing on the state level in the current environment that's happening with birth control access? Sure, that's a great question. And there are many exciting efforts going on across the country. I won't be able to share them all, but I do wanna start by providing a little bit of context. At Power to Decide, we often refer to the fact that there's a menu of policy options for increasing access to contraception. And while none alone is a silver bullet, states are working to improve access and different places are doing it in different ways depending on the needs of their state. This is because policymakers understand the benefits of expanding access, whether it's because of the cost savings it can produce or the benefits to maternal and infant health that come when women can plan and space their families or myriad other benefits. And birth control is highly popular. Our polling, which I can talk about more later, has consistently found that across geographic regions, race and ethnicity, and political affiliation, people agree that birth control is a basic part of women's health. So I'll highlight a few trends and follow with individual state examples. Regarding trends, in addition to pharmacists prescribing to others, we've seen taking hold our coverage for an extended supply of contraception and protecting coverage for access to the full range of methods. The most popular is requiring an extended supply of prescription contraceptives. Insurance plans have typically covered 30 to 90 day supplies at one time. And limiting the supply of prescription contraceptives to these short intervals reduces timely access to contraception and can create gaps in use. And I, Courtney, some of the, what you said at the beginning about having, go to, having to go to a, um, a provider every single month, some of those things can also pop up here if you have to go to the pharmacy every single month. So for instance, making, for me, it might not be a big deal, it may just be an inconvenience, but you know, if you imagine for a moment, people who are working to make ends meet, Getting to the pharmacy when it's open might be a heavy burden depending on your work schedule, the pharmacy's hours, if there's public transit at all, and if it's what its operating schedule is. So that's during normal times and now COVID has only exacerbated these challenges. So removing that barrier of having to return to the pharmacy every month or every few months can reduce unplanned pregnancies that result um, from a delay in accessing contraception. In fact, there was a study from Bigsby Center for Global Reproductive Health that found a 12 month supply of birth control decreased unplanned pregnancies by 30% when compared to a one or three month supply. It also found that that 12 month supply reduced the odds of abortion by 46%. And then another analysis from researchers at the VA in coordination with the University of Pittsburgh showed that adoption of 12 month dispensing would result in substantial cost savings and reduction of unplanned pregnancy. So currently there's 21 states that have this policy on the books. West Virginia was the most recent state to pass this. The majority of them require 12 months of coverage um, or coverage for a 12 month supply and two states have a six month requirement. As I noted earlier, different states are taking different actions all with a shared goal of expanding access to birth control. And some states have decided that means codifying federal guidelines that require all non-grandfathered health plans to cover at least one contraceptive for each of the FDA approved methods for women as prescribed without co-pays or deductibles. And providing coverage for the full range of birth control methods is important because we know that every body is different. And we also know that women's bodies change over time. What works for a person at one point in their lives may not work at another time. So at the federal level, you may have heard this referred to this benefit as the ACA birth control benefit and states ranging from Maine to Nevada have taken action to codify similar protections at the state level. Most of those 16 states have recognized opportunities to actually expand on the federal guidance and some are also requiring coverage for things like over the counter 
methods without a prescription and male sterilization, for example. So in addition to those two trends, and I'll wrap up soon, we're also seeing states get innovative with both federal and state funding. So those state budgets are often strained, some have appropriated state funds to increase access to birth control because they understand the cost effectiveness of doing so. So we saw a few years ago, Arkansas allocated funds in its budget to local health departments. So they could be able to stock long acting methods of birth control, such as the IUD and the implant, which are the most expensive methods and can be hard for providers to stock. Um, and they're also including this in this year's budget, which is underway right now. And Texas had a budget rider that directed the state to start using funds allocated in that budget to implement policies, increasing access to LARC and vasectomy. And then on the other hand, you have Virginia and Tennessee that are using federal funds to expand access. So Virginia implemented a pilot program to increase education about and access to LARC using some of the state's federal TANF funds. It reimburses providers for the provision of LARC to patients that uh, have income below 250% of the poverty level. And there's also communications aspect of that pilot to improve awareness and utilization of Virginia's Medicaid family planning program which provides services for just family planning. And then Tennessee's law, um, they require health, the Department of Health to administer a program to improve information about and access to contraception, again, um, with a focus on voluntary reversible long-acting contraception, which they call VLARC, using available federal funds. So I'll end with that example, but I do want to point out the fact that Tennessee calling it VLARC does not mean that Virginia or other states that don't call it voluntary are not voluntary. Rather, it's an acknowledgement of the history of coercing women, specifically low income and women of color into using certain methods. I wanna stress that while these methods should be available to everyone, hence it's great to see states filling the gap, they're not right for everyone. So we wanna be careful that we're not coercing people or suggesting that they are right for everyone. And I'll end with that. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. It's really interesting to hear um, all the various ways that birth control access is impacted. Like I said, I think a lot of people are familiar with push for over-the-counter access, but there are so many other hindrances to access. Like you said, prescription limits um, and being able to, you know, go and get, you know, six months or 12 months of a supply at a time and having insurance cover, it, cover that much. Um, so that's really interesting. And so with that, I want to pivot kind of still on the question of access and uh, ask Becca a little bit about this. I think, um, as I mentioned, Becca is a clinical associate professor at the University of Georgia. Um, and I, you know, I feel like maybe for those in DC who um, are a little less familiar with this, I think maybe you and I being in uh, more uh, typically considered rural states, um, you being in Georgia, me being in Alabama, where we see a little bit more of this access issue when it comes to location and that sort of thing. So just in your experience um, in Georgia, and I know Athens isn't necessarily rural, it's a, one of my favorite college towns that I've ever been to, but could you tell us why access to birth control in some of these rural or even just non-metropolitan parts of the country um, is still an issue and how pharmacists are playing a role in bridging that gap between birth control access and the need for it? Yeah. Um, first, thanks for the introduction, Courtney. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here today and talk about this important issue um, for women in our communities. So I think, you know, just to kind of set the stage, most of you already know that women who live in rural or non-metro areas have limited access to reproductive health services. Georgia, Alabama, the Southeast has a lot of rural areas, as do a lot of other states out in the West. When we look at the U.S. as a whole, about 75% of the land area in the U.S. is actually considered rural. And of the population in those rural areas, about a fifth of them are adult women. So we have a significant portion of the population living in these rural areas um, that may face significant disparities in accessing reproductive services, including effective contraception. So specifically, women might find that provider availability is especially challenging. And we know this because the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists put out a report uh, about health disparities for rural women. 
and they found that less than 10% of practicing obstetricians are actually in those rural areas. So women may have to take travel further distances for appointments, they have to take time off work, they have to get childcare, a lot of, I think Tara mentioned some of these as well, um, secure transportation in order to attend a traditional appointment and obtain a hormonal contraceptive, and that's not necessary. Um, in particular, teens living in rural areas may face barriers. So we know the National Survey of Family Growth told us that about 40% of rural teens are sexually active, which is higher than about their um, peers. About 30% of urban teens tend to be sexually active. However, there's a lower use of contraception in those rural areas. So we know that teens in rural areas are more likely to have sex, but less likely to use contraception. And I believe that part of that's related to access. So I think pharmacists prescribed contraception is one of the ways that we can address access issues for women in these areas. And data indicate that more than 90% of women in the US live within five miles of a pharmacy. We know that pharmacies cover a wider geographic area and can be found in many communities that don't have medical providers readily avail available, including in my state. We have a lot of counties that have pharmacies but may not have access to a clinic or a medical provider. Also, pharmacies have extended hours compared to clinics, so they're often open nights, weekends, holidays. You know, you can even find 24-hour pharmacies in a lot of communities. While there are exceptions, clinics tend to offer a more limited 9-to-5 schedule, and they often require an appointment. Um, you know, as a faculty member at the University of Georgia, I have firsthand knowledge about our curriculum and what it takes to be a pharmacist. You know, nationwide, pharmacy students have to complete a rigorous doctorate program. It's almost always a four-year program, although there are some accelerated three-year programs. But when people come out with this doctorate, they're ready to serve the community as medication experts. Effective hormonal contraceptives have been safely used by women for more than 50 years. And pharmacists are well-trained to help women select and use these medications effectively. So I believe, you know, pharmacy graduates are ready to provide these critical services. And, and I personally am really looking forward to a time when my state is ready to utilize this resource for the women in our communities. So in Georgia, pharmacists can't prescribe yet. And I feel like that's definitely an underutilized resource. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the handful of states that have already authorized pharmacists prescribed contraception. So we have data coming out of California, Oregon, and New Mexico that have demonstrated that pharmacist prescribing has been embraced in both rural and urban areas. And I think this is really important because some prior research had indicated that pharmacists prescribed emergency contraception may not be as readily available in rural areas. And that doesn't appear to be the case with the initial data we have from these pharmacists prescribed contraception states. So the early data out of California came from two studies and it showed that while only five to 10% of pharmacies were offering that service in the beginning, um, they both had equal rates of pharmacist um, prescribed contraception in rural and urban areas. So no difference between rural and urban areas, which is good news, right? And then as we continued on, more recent data um, has shown that 45% of the pharmacies in Oregon are offering the service now, and Oregon was the first to implement pharmacist prescribing. And then 20% of the pharmacies in New Mexico, which came online more recently, are offering um, pharmacist prescribed contraception. Um, and the data showed the same thing. So rural and urban areas had um, equivalent rates of pharmacist uptake. So again, this is um, encouraging. It shows that you know, pharmacists are penetrating into those rural areas and we're um, hopefully accessing some of those uh, women in hard to reach places. So you know, in summary, I think that the data indicate there's a need for improved contraceptive access in rural areas, both in my state and in many other states in the nation. Pharmacists are very well trained to provide this medication and other comprehensive medication management services. Um, and they're already established in areas where tr traditional prescribers are scarce. So based on these facts, I think pharmacists have an important role to play in providing contraception for women, especially in rural communities, again, both in my state and in, in many others.
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Becca. And that really feeds into what I wanted to talk to Sally about, too. As I mentioned in the beginning, Sally, you've worked with not only state legislatures on this, but also pharmacists across the country um, and training them to provide this service. So can you maybe go talk a little bit about how this became your main area of focus um, in your pharmacy practice? What led you to that? And sort of what's been your experience with pharmacists being um, in, involved or um, who want to be involved in prescribing contraception? Uh, to patients directly in their states. Yeah, thank you so much, Courtney. And I definitely agree with all of the comments of the other panelists so far. Um, I'm so proud to participate in this panel. Um, obviously, it's just right along the mission that's so close to my heart, um, along with other wonderful advocates, and to be able to represent the voice of pharmacists who are out there providing this service. Um, and also helping others do it. Um, so I've been actually working on this initiative um, in probably for 15 years now since I was a pharmacy student um, because at that time my eyes were really open to the potential for pharmacists to contribute to a lot of gaps in healthcare um, and specifically birth control delivery. Uh, so during pharmacy school, we were trained to provide high quality care. Um, like Dr. Stone mentioned, um, you know, the, the level of education and training is, is really fantastic. Um, and it became really apparent to me at that time that I was much more qualified to do things, like more things than I was allowed to do um, per my, you know, scope of practice. Um, I was qualified to provide a lot of needed healthcare services, um, whether they be preventative health services like immunizations and birth control, um, um, or more kind of treatment and management of conditions that are very, you know, medication um, heavy in terms of how they're managed. Um, and then I would, you know, go into my intern practice sites as a pharmacy student and, and even as a recent, you know, new grad after pharmacy school, and I would see patients come in and they come in with their stories of the different, you know, symptoms they're experiencing. They would show me their rash or I would see that they have pink eye. And I knew exactly what medication they needed, you know, to treat that small ailment, but my hands were tied. You know, I had the medication sitting right there on the shelf, but I couldn't give it to them. So I'd have to send them down to the local urgent care um, or clinic. They'd have to sit there for a couple of hours, you know, pay whatever fee, um, depending on, you know, insurance coverage, get that prescription come back to the pharmacy and get that medication. And, you know, obviously the patients are frustrated by that process, but as a pharmacist, it's also frustrating because we just want to help people. Um, so, you know, I saw this was just a big waste. It was a, a waste of time, um, a waste of healthcare resources. You know, those urgent care centers should really probably be dealing with, you know, broken bones and, you know, really ill people and, and not little things that we can help um, triage in the pharmacy and of course dollars right patients out-of-pocket costs and the money involved with the healthcare delivery in an urgent care versus a pharmacy for example um, and these are services that pharmacists are providing in other countries and actually starting to hear in some US states too. So um, it's really encouraging that people are finally realizing that, you know, pharmacies can really act like neighborhood health centers to some extent and help with the triaging and treatment of small ailments and, and really reserving our more kind of higher level healthcare providers for the services where they are needed most. Um, so kind of back to when I was a student um, in the early 2000s, at that time, pharmacists in California were beginning to prescribe emergency contraception. Um, so we didn't have an over-the-counter emergency contraceptive pill at the time, and so pharmacists were beginning to prescribe that under a statewide protocol to help with access. Um, and then shortly after that began, and I was helping to outreach and get pharmacists engaged in that process, we got results from a a uh, research study in Washington State, and that was a game changer. So this study in Washington State was the first study that looked at women going straight to the pharmacy for their birth control. And the results were undeniable. Women were satisfied. Um, the care that was provided by pharmacists was as safe as traditional providers. And so we knew that that model worked. Um, and the next step was just, you know, how do we now implement this, right? We, we have the evidence from that study and other research studies. And, and we know women want this service um, based on studies you know, that show more women would start using birth control if they could get it at the pharmacy or that they would continue using it because it might be easier for them to access it at the pharmacy uh, compared to other places. And so we had all this evidence. We, you know, we have the science, we have the data, and it's just now implementing it. Um, 
the just before getting into like the implementation model um, these just to remind everyone these birth control products whether we're talking about pills patches rings other more effective methods they're all still prescription only so the fda would need to approve any medications for over-the-counter access so uh, these medications remain prescription only and so our approach here is to expand the pharmacist scope of practice to be able to prescribe these products um, they're prescription only products that pharmacists are prescribing um, and so the way we achieve that is at the state level, expanding the pharmacist scope of practice to include prescribing these products. Um, and because we have so many states in our lovely country, you know, it does take a while to implement this. Um, but I'm so proud to say that we now have over 3,000 pharmacies in 11 states and Washington, D.C. that are participating and offering the service to their communities. And more and more pharmacies begin offering the service every month. Um, you know, maintain the birthcontrolpharmacies.com website where we have a map where people can see which pharmacies near them are offering the service. Um, and we know people are coming to the website and they're seeking this out. Um, so it's making a real difference for the people that live in these communities and in these neighborhoods. Um, and, and it's all about access and options. Um, we certainly don't imagine that this is, you know, the only solution, um, as Tara mentioned. This is just another way where we want to create options for people. If they feel like this is the best place for them to go to get their birth control, fantastic. If they want to continue to go to their OBGYN, wonderful. Um, you know, it's just, it's just about giving people options. Um, and the pharmacists want to be there um, to provide the service. We know that. Um, and my patients tell me all the time, like, oh gosh, I'm so happy you're here. It was so convenient for me, you know, in my own neighborhood to come in and see you. And, you know, they walk out with their birth control in their hand. So, um, it's, it's really rewarding to be able to help people. Um, you know, I see patients coming to see me because their schedule is just more conducive to coming into the pharmacy to see me, or maybe they're between jobs or between insurance, um, and it just makes sense for them to come to the pharmacy uh, while they wait for their insurance to kick in or while they establish a new primary care provider. So I know you had a couple of questions for me. Did I answer everything? <laughs> no, I think you did. Um, okay. And, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things I was going to ask about why it's crucial in today's healthcare environment, but we'll hold that because sure. I want to hear from everybody on that, honestly. Yeah. I think when we were, we were discussing all of this um, at the time of putting this event together, the world looked a lot different. So we'll get to that <laughs> um, and the implications for what things look like now. Um, and so we've, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, Tally, as you mentioned, there needs to be FDA approval to get these products over the counter completely, um, which I think is a good distinction to make because yes, this is simply expanding the scope of practice for pharmacists to be able to prescribe. Uh, therefore, you're increasing the number of providers that women can see for birth control. Um, and obviously, this is a state level effort being made. Um, but I'm curious to, to hear from uh, Tara, she may have a really good sense of this. And then also, of course, open it up to anyone else who, uh, who has an answer to this. What are some of the lessons that you think we can learn on a federal level, um, given that the model is different uh, for, you know, access or for reforming birth control access on a federal level than state level? But what are some of the lessons that, you know, if you were to talk to federal legislators um, that you would, you know, try to apply from what we've seen on the state level and what they could maybe do to bolster some of those efforts? Sure. So. No, I think that we see a bipartisan recognition at the state level um, of the value of birth control, even if reasons for doing so may differ or if different policymakers get there in different ways. So our own polling shows there's strong bipartisan support for the idea that birth control should be a basic part of women's health. And this includes 66% of Republicans and 91% of Democrats and also strong support for access to the full range of methods, uh, whereas 75% of Republicans, 87% of independents, and 93% of Democrats agree people should have um, access to the full range. And this support's also consistent across regions of the, the US. So contrary to what some people might assume, birth control is widely popular and not something policymakers need to be afraid of. Um, and they certainly aren't when it's at the state level. 
And on the point of supporting access to the full range of methods, we've seen state legislators on both sides of the aisle come to recognize the importance of having access to the full range of FDA approved methods. A few years ago, there was an uptick in interest and activity on both sides of the aisle over increasing access to long acting methods after the results from Colorado, um, which you may have heard about in the, in the news media. The Colorado Family Planning Initiative was a privately funded initiative to fill gaps in access to birth control. And it found in the first five years that it dramatically reduced unintended pregnancy, abortion, and avoided nearly $70 million in public assistance costs. And the, um, there's been even higher declines have been realized since that study, since that time, and it's empowered thousands of women's, women to make their own choice on when or whether to start a family. So one of the things that the Colorado Initiative did to fill gaps with subsidized cost of LARCs, the most expensive methods. Um, so subsidizing them does make sense, but as I mentioned earlier, they aren't right for everyone. Um, so there's, and there's also concerns about coercion. So I think policymakers um, at the state level and others have come to better understand this over time. For instance, we see that South Dakota has changed their Medicaid policy to require coverage for IUD removal regardless of the reason, which is the best practice and most states do. Tennessee referring to it as voluntary LARC, as well as state interest in pharmacists prescribing where you obviously cannot get an IUD. So increasing increased awareness about um, the full range of methods and not just having one as the magical method. And I also want to make sure to note what's true about these laws, but what I think pharmacist prescribing helps illustrate well, and um, Dr. Stone and Dr. Raffi have um, alluded to, is the details of the policy and how it's implemented do matter. Um, we see that California and Oregon were the first two states to pass them, and they have had different experiences implementing it. Um, in part, California struggled with a lack of reimbursement when the law was initially passed, so I think that may be part of the reason why they've um, had some lower uptake, but certainly Dr. Rafi could speak more to that. Um, so the importance as well of focusing on how the actual laws, once you pass them, are implemented is important and something you can learn from the states. Yeah, absolutely. And Sally, if you want to speak to implementation, because that's something that's been on the forefront of our minds, our street is how, you know, good policy doesn't mean just passing a bill, it means actually getting it to work for you. And that's, you know, something that every, every, uh, you know, legislative effort struggles with. And so it's really interesting to hear how, how your experience has been in implementation. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a good segue. Um, before I answer that, I do want to just, for your last question, asking about kind of federal um, policy. One thing that's very much related to implementation in the states that we can impact on a federal level would be pharmacist provider status. Um, we are healthcare providers, but we are not recognized as such by health insurance plans. And in a time when most women have health insurance and most health insurance plans cover birth control services, they should be able to use that whether they meet with a pharmacist for their birth control or a nurse practitioner or a physician or a nurse midwife. Um, so I think that definitely on a federal level is something that could make a big difference for um, people being able to use their insurance with the provider of their choice. Um, and really reducing out-of-pocket costs for patients who are already spending a lot of money on health insurance premiums. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring that up. Um, in terms of implementation, you know, it's, it's um, definitely multifaceted and something that hasn't gotten enough attention. Um, we've done a good job in some states getting an initial policy passed, um, but the, the design of that initial policy is really critical, actually. Um, some of the policies have been very much evidence-based, um, don't have age restrictions, include all of the methods that are FDA approved that could be self-administered by patients, um, and are really in line with the CDC guidelines around contraceptive use. And that has really made it easier for pharmacists to deliver evidence-based care. 
some of the protocols, unfortunately, and, and legislation that has passed in some states has had additional restrictions, which just makes it more challenging when you have to pick and choose which of your patients you can offer services to or which methods you're able to offer them. Um, so uh, certainly having evidence-based uh, policies up front, um, I think is really critical for implementation. And um, we've you know, spoken with policymakers to help with that up front, um, and I'm available and happy to consult with anybody who's interested in exploring this in their state to make sure that we set this up for success from the get go. Some other things that are really critical for implementation um, again, the payment for pharmacist services. Um, the pharmacists are, of course, providing the same service in doing a comprehensive consultation, um, pro you know, providing education to the patient about all the methods that are available to them, um, including IUDs, implants, the methods they can get at the pharmacy, um, and helping to assess their health history and, and blood pressure to determine what's safe for them to use, um, writing the prescription, providing education on how to use their method, what to expect. Um, you know, it's, it's the same consultation and it takes time. And so pharmacists need to be able to um, basically get paid for that service from the patient's health insurance the same way that a physician or nurse practitioner, a physician assistant would be able to bill for that visit. So and that's definitely something that's critical for implementation. Um, you know, training for pharmacists. Pharmacists are extremely risk averse uh, group of professionals. Um, they're kind of perfectionists in the way they do things and they definitely will want to seek out additional training um, when it comes to this before um, going out and doing it. So that's definitely part of implementation. Um, but another big part is um, public awareness. Um, in a lot of states where this is available, we find that people just don't know it's an option. Um, so while we're doing a great job of, of getting pharmacies on board to offer this, how do we connect the dots to make sure that people know this is an option that's available to them? Yeah, that's a great point. Getting people out there um, and knowing that they have the availability of pharmacists is crucial to this, um, as well as some of the things you mentioned about billing um, and being able to be recognized as a provider, which is uh, really important for this as well. Um, so I guess then to that, I kind of want to, to circle back to something that I mentioned a little bit ago, which is, you know, obviously the world has changed quite a bit in just about a month. Um, and, you know, we've thought a lot about how this affects um, you know, efforts to increase birth control access on the state level and the federal level. Um, and I, you know, we may be biased, but I think it's pretty objective to say that uh, this really only highlights the need for better access um, and not only to birth control to, you know, healthcare services in general, um, because, you know, the world kind of shut down access to in-person visits and that's really affected people in a myriad of ways. So I'm just curious um, to hear you all uh, in, in your respective fields and some of the things that you're particularly focused on with birth control access, what do you think the next, let's say, year to five years is going to look like in terms of legislative reform? Um, and do you think it's overall going to be for the better? Or, you know, you can talk about, like I said, something in particular that you've been working on that's important to you and what you think it's going to look like. Um, and do you think that we're going to come out of the pandemic with better access in general? Um, or at least, is that going to highlight the importance of it? So I'll let anyone go. <laughs> I just threw a lot at you, so you can take a second. <laughs> it's a big question. Um, and we've, at our street, we've talked about it a lot in terms of telehealth. Um, you know, we've, we've been uh, pleasantly surprised at how some of the reforms, the regulatory reforms that we've uh, advocated for that would normally be a long uphill battle. Uh, governors have literally wiped out some of those regulations overnight. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm optimistic that we'll see some similar success with birth control, but, you know, obviously need to be cautiously optimistic. So just curious to hear what all of your thoughts are on that. I can chime in a bit around that. I think during this time, people have recognized that their local pharmacy is an essential health service. Um, so I think just raising awareness around that and, and what people go to the pharmacy for now and what they wish they could go to the pharmacy for, I think has really been brought to light during all of this. Um, and a lot of pharmacies, of course, are, are able to adapt and, and be like kind of nimble in this scenario and, and providing things like curbside pickup, um, doing text messaging with patients, doing, um, you know, 
deliveries in their local communities and, and really being a community resource. And um, we've already seen some emergency regulations being put in place, um, allowing pharmacists to continue, um, you know, for whether it be 30 days, 90 days, patients' essential medications, which I think we all agree birth control falls in that category. Um, but it, it really, I think, hopefully is opening people's eyes that this is something pharmacies, um, you know, and pharmacists can and should be doing. So hopefully we can continue to um, build on this unfortunate situation and better kind of prepare ourselves for making sure our patients are able to get what they need in all circumstances and not just in emergencies. Yeah, I want to second what um, Sally said. You know, I think that with many states allowing pharmacists to prescribe those extended 30 to authorize the extended 30 to 90 day supplies of medication, they've really asked us to step up and use our clinical judgment, make sure we're assessing medication therapy appropriately, taking, you know, the lead in making sure patients have what they need. And, and really, um, you know, they've called on us in a kind time of need. And I think they've acknowledged that we have those skills. Um, and I think that this is a good opportunity for us to reflect back on that and say, hey, you know, we have had the ability to help in this time of need. Why not in uh, other times as well? And I think that um, part of that overlap comes with a little bit of uh, turf, you know, and making sure that people are holding on to, to their um, their prescribing authority. And, and you know, I, I think there's plenty of room to go around. You know, pharmacists um, are adding to patient care, not detracting from someone else's um, profit margins. And I'll just add or echo that, yes, I think telemedicine is definitely going to be a big thing for all of healthcare, of, of course, but um, particularly for birth control, and we're already seeing that. Um, and you know, another thing that we have seen with some states were, that have the pharmacist prescribing model is allowing the pharmacist to prescribe and to, to dispense, sorry, at one time, 12 months. So, and I know not all of those states do that, so maybe this will be sort of the impetus for some of those states going back and readjusting or examining their protocols to make sure that pharmacists have that authority, regardless of whether there's a pandemic. And, you know, this is actually a, qu a question I have, and I don't know the answer to um, for our pharmacist, is that if you had a ability to do telemedicine from the pharmacy, if there were a secret, uh, a private area, is that something that she would be able to be reimbursed for under current laws in your state? Yeah, so in Georgia, there would be no mechanism to reimburse the pharmacist for that through insurance payers. It would have to be paid out of pocket by the patient. And that reflects back to what Sally said and, and provider status. You know, until we're recognized as providers, it's on the uh, state by state um, responsibility to determine what they're going to authorize payment for for pharmacists. So I'll, I'll turn it to Sally. I know they have the ability to use bill codes and um, bill for a variety of things. And I'll let her talk a little more about that. Yeah, in, in the states where they've done kind of state-based recognition of pharmacists as providers, um, California is one of them, um, where our state Medicaid program will pay for the consultation and the visit um, with a pharmacist for, for birth control. And during this time, they have expanded that to include telehealth. Um, However, for some birth control methods, there is typically a blood pressure measurement required. So then we have to, um, you know, we're not able to provide all methods uh, with telehealth, but at least some methods. Um, and certainly for patients where we have a blood pressure measurement on file. So I think that having that option is really important um, and something that pharmacies are, are well equipped to provide. I certainly during this time have seen some patients myself um, with telehealth. I will say really quickly um, to our participants, please submit your questions now um, in the Q&A box and we will start to read those. We encourage any questions you have because um, there are obviously a lot of questions around all of this stuff, as I mentioned, especially in light of the pandemic. So feel free to ask your questions. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to build off of that. I was just thinking that, you know, maybe in a year we'll have a panel on the evidence of telepharmacy access and how it's working because um, there, you know, the, the expansion of telehealth has gone beyond 
beyond just your typical, you know, doctor patient uh, interaction. It's gone into all sorts of things, um, telepsychiatry, teledentistry, you know, everything. So I think we're really going to see some of these regulatory models shift into a positive way. Um, and then my hope, at least, and what we're planning to do at our street is um, when regulators or legislators decide that uh, we need to go back to the status quo, we'll say, nope, because look at all this evidence on how uh, this model has worked in a time of emergency. So why wouldn't it work in a, in a normal time? Um, and so that's something that we're really excited about uh, focusing on. But um, yeah, so if the audience has questions, as I said, please submit um, and we will answer them. This is uh, a really nice way to get some people, uh, you know, from, we were supposed to have this event on Capitol Hill, um, as most of you probably know, and uh, we decided that we wanted to host it sooner rather than later, um, given everything going on. We think it's really important for everyone to uh, know what's going on on the state level and the federal level. Um, so this has been really, really great for us. Um, and if we'll wait on questions again, but something I wanted to touch on too um, with Sally and Becca and uh, Tara too, please do, because I know you guys have, have uh, experienced this as well. What is the general support for better access to birth control in whatever form it may take, whether it's extending prescription refills, whether it's, you know, uh, allowing pharmacists to prescribe. Um, what has been the general reaction in the medical community and how do you think that's either helped or hurt some of the birth control access reform models? I can get us started on that. Um, you know, all of the professional associations like the American Medical Association, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and even the American Academy of Family Physicians um, have all put out statements supporting um, access to birth control, whether that be with pharmacists prescribing or actually completely over the counter. Um, and I think it's just, we, we can't deny the evidence that, you know, women are able to decide if this is a good method for them, um, that they will use the birth control they have access to, that they'll continue using it if they have access to it. Um, I mean, I think just all the evidence around people need access to birth control and supplies of it. Um, it's just, it's a no brainer, I think, in terms of the, the science of it. And so there's really no evidence um, that suggests anything else would be appropriate at this time. So that's really reassuring. And I think, of course, we would love to see evidence based policies in our country. So um, I think that from a science and medical perspective, all the evidence points to increasing access and letting people have the birth control that works for them and that they want. And I'll, I'll just add that, you know, we our polling is not looking at specific mechanisms or ways for how people would get birth control. But as I cited our stats earlier, there is really broad support, no matter your um, political affiliation or where you live in the country for Women, ha women having access to birth control. Um, in terms of their, one thing I will just add is, um, and Dr. Rafi just mentioned about, um, you know, being evidence-based that women can take birth control and, you know, know how to see whether there's a contraindications and all of that. Um, something that we've seen a little bit, most, mostly anecdotally, but, um, we did do a some polling some years back um, on young Republicans and birth control. And something that we saw there, and I've seen pop up in other places, is uh, when you talk about not pharmacists prescribing, but over the counter, is um, because people, I think because people for so long have gone to a provider to get birth control, some concern where they feel like, oh, can I do that? Or is that a proper thing to do? So I think, you know, whatever we can do as advocates and medical community to make sure that, okay, pharmacists knowing that um, and providers knowing that is, is one thing, but also changing um, the, the general populist view about, yes, it is safe to take, you can um, take it and, and monitor yourself. So just, I guess doing more public communication about that aspect could probably be helpful. 
Yeah, I think that's really important because, you know, it's it's hard to shift sort of the window of what people think is acceptable because they've been in here for so long. Um, and to shift that into showing, you know, the evidence-based, as Sally said, the evidence-based policy that, you know, really reflects what we know to date um, is really important. And I, I want to echo what you said about bipartisanship, something that we've seen on the state level has been... Um, perhaps a somewhat surprising amount of bipartisanship on these efforts. Um, and uh, I don't know if Representative Kitchens is going to get to join us before this ends, but I'll just uh, talk a little bit about the work he's done in Wisconsin. Um, he, as a Republican assembly member in Wisconsin, has introduced um, a pharmacy access to birth control bill where he's been working um, both with Republicans and across the aisle uh, for support for the pharmacy access model in Wisconsin. And, you know, they've had a, a very uh, encouraging number of uh, legislators sign on to that bill which, you know, isn't always the case, but I think that that model is going to prove um, one that we should follow in terms of looking for the bipartisan, the bipartisan support for that model. Um, and it, like I said, it's been really encouraging on the state level to see bipartisan support. And I think it's, you know, one of those cases where, you know, the old saying where, uh, you know, if you go outside and talk to your neighbor, you're not as different as you think. A lot of people support the idea of having greater access to birth control. The over-the-counter thing does sometimes throw them. Um, but, I, you know, I think we need more of that on the federal level, which is one of the things I wanted to make sure I mentioned before um, we conclude this, is that I think one of the, the lessons for federal legislators and the federal uh, you know, reform community is that the state level and the local level, you are seeing more of this um, uh, widespread support. And we want to see that on the federal level as well. It seems much more contentious on a federal level when it really shouldn't be. Um, a lot of the things that we're asking, you know, to do on uh, the right of center or left of center are similar, especially in principle. So we want to make sure that we're, we're working together where we can and not letting the differences sort of split us because in the meantime, we're we're actively, you know, affecting people and how they access their medication and the lives that they want to live. Um, and, you know, given all of the research that's come out around, you know, women's support for better access to birth control, if they would use it more, if they would use different methods more, um, how that impacts their day-to-day -day lives um, is really important to, you know, can't be emphasized enough that we really need to sort of come together on the federal level um, in, in getting some of these reform measures pushed, um, you know, with making birth control over the counter through the FDA, who knows what that's going to look like over the next couple of years right now, but, um, we're still optimistic, I think, and generally the, the, um, the answer I've gotten is that it's, it's in the works, so we'll see, but, um, you know, in the meantime, like I said, it's, it's crucial, I think it's really been eye-opening to see that we can't wait on an over-the-counter, uh, measure to, happen. We need to do things in the meantime to make sure that we're spreading access um, and making our, our, our system to healthcare access a little bit more robust. So um, with that, again, if anyone wants to submit a question, please do. Um, but otherwise, I will open it up to everyone for concluding remarks, anything that you didn't get to talk about or anything you want to highlight, feel free to plug whatever you want to plug. Um, and we will be sure to send out an email to all of the attendees after this with some of the links from all of the organizations represented here, anything they wanted you to see in terms of research or outreach um, so that you have access to that as well. So I'll turn it over to you guys if everyone wants to start. I'll start. <laughs> I'll start. So, Thank you for this opportunity to be on the panel. It's great to be with you all virtually today. And we have lots of state policy resources on our website at powertodecide.org. We have a state policy portal and on many uh, fact sheets on many of these different policies that we've mentioned today. And we'll also be launching some maps um, in the next few weeks showing which states have these policies, the most popular ones that I mentioned today. Um, my closing remarks are fairly, uh, fairly general, but I, I want to thank you again for inviting me. Uh, it's a great um, opportunity to come and talk to you guys about such an important issue. But the things that I want to highlight are women know their bodies and they know what's best for them. And they know what birth control is right for them. Pharmacists are well trained and 
people trust pharmacists and between those two things, I think we have a real opportunity to help women access the products that they need um, in a timely fashion. So. Agree with with all of that. Um, thanks again for hosting the session. Um, it was a great opportunity and um, really hopeful that some folks are inspired by what they heard today and would like to make some changes for their um, communities and uh, birth control pharmacist is here as a resource um, for anyone who's interested in um, designing legislation that is evidence-based um, if you're interested in in building in some of those implementation issues up front um, so that it's more successful in your state um, or anything else that we can do to, to bridge um, the policymakers with the pharmacists association in your state or other champions in your state, um, you know, we're available to help work with you to, to move this forward and, and make a difference in your communities. Yeah, uh, and with that, I will let you all go if you want to. Thank you all again for this. Um, it's been really important to hear what you guys are doing on the state and federal levels. And uh, we're really excited about uh, moving forward to some of this and working with you guys in the future. So thank you so much.